So with that, um, welcome everybody to uh, this episode of our AI governance virtual symposium. This um, series is hosted by the Yale Information Society project in collaboration with the Institute for Technology, Law and Policy at Georgetown University. It's my great pleasure to welcome this wonderful panel. We have three panelists in alphabetical order, Chinmay Arun from the Information Society Project at Yale Law School, where she's a resident fellow. Um, Jessica L. Rich, um, who is a senior fellow with the Institute for Technology, Law and Policy at Georgetown University, and uh, former director of the Bureau um, of Consumer Protection um, at the Federal Trade Commission. We also have uh, Lucilla Scioli, um, director at the European Commission and responsible for artificial intelligence at DG Connect. The panel is moderated by um, Anupam Chander, who is a professor of law at the University of Georgia, of Georgetown, I'm so sorry. Um, with that, and without any further ado, I'll turn it over to our moderator, um, Anupam. Anupam, take it off. Thank you so much, Nick. Uh, uh, I'm honored to have the opportunity to talk to some of the leading voices across the world and one of the uh, leading regulators across the world um, on uh, issues of uh, AI governance. And the purpose of our discussion this morning is trying to figure out how it, are countries approaching AI regulation. Uh, and so we have three leading um, uh, interpreters of, uh, of these regulations um, uh, with us this morning. And I'm gonna begin my, uh, my conversation by asking Chinmay Arun, who is a professor at uh, the University of New, uh, uh, New, I'm sorry, at New Delhi uh, National Law School, um, and also a resident fellow at the Information Society Project at Yale, um, the, the kickoff question. So Chinmay, uh, uh, the, what do you see as the most pressing concerns raised by the rapid deployment of AI in non-Western countries? And can you give us an ex examples of AI that kind of most worry you uh, from a perspective of the kind of global majority, uh, as I think you've s described it from time to time, um, and any examples of AI that you think might in fact be helpful um, for the global majority? Thank you, Anupam. I hope that I may begin by thanking you, Nick, and you, Anupam, for, for inviting me to be a part of this wonderful session. Um, and for um, you know, asking me to speak about questions that uh, that that I really care about and and can hold forth on <laughs> for for ages, uh, it's really it's such a pleasure, and this is such a it's such a thoughtfully crafted session. Um, I'm I'm going to draw on a book chapter that that I'd written that was titled AI and the Global South. Uh, and I have, as you as you pointed out, I have now taken to calling the global South the majority world, which is Shahidul Alam's term, uh, and I think accurately describes the, the the countries that we referred to as the global South. Before I start, I want to caveat the fact that since I worked in in India for a number of years, my experience of the global South has been centered in a particular country, and of course, different countries in the majority world have different experiences. I have tried to pull out of this um, ideas that I think are relatively they are they are generalizable. But if you think of if you think of the majority world and the minority world in terms of power, uh, but I do I do want to say that I don't speak for everyone. And in an ideal world, uh, we we would have more people discussing different experiences from from the majority world. So so the two things that I'm going to focus on are. Um, datafication and algorithmic mediation of services. And, and before I get into that, I, I do I want to rule out the internal algorithmic society. So I'm what I'm not discussing right now is the ways in which uh, the transition to AI by local industry might be affecting the majority world. And I'm steering clear of that because I imagine that that is different in, for example, South Korea, uh, Brazil, Argentina, and, and India. Um, and so if we think of, of AI mainly in terms of the major multinational companies that are based, um, and I'm sticking to the US, although I don't want to note that China's 
uh, AI companies are, are also significant in terms of uh, global influence. Um, and then if we think of it in terms of the cross, cross border, both, uh, bo both cross border extraction of data, which is necessary for, for machine learning, and then, and then algorithmically mediated services and products that are being offered to countries in the majority world, then I think that there's a number of questions that we should worry about. Uh, one in part is that that data isn't a natural resource, even though people like to say data is the new oil. The thing is that it isn't sitting there for people to pick up. Datafication is a process and choices are made in how to record data. And so the, uh, the, the simple example of, of the choices that are made, for example, is if you construct a data set in which people are coded as either male or female, that data set will, set will erase people that don't identify as male, male or female. And that's a, it's a particular worldview. I think that that's significant, especially when we're thinking of Western com companies that have a particular imaginary and certain norms uh, that they use to see society. And then they acquire data sets or they gather data in other parts of the world in ways that don't necessarily make sense for that part of the world. And it's interesting, this is new because uh, Chris Bailey famously wrote about how when, um, when the British were trying to understand India as the colonial power and they tried to do it by gathering data sets and, and recording data, they made a lot of mistakes because they were bringing a vision of society that just it didn't fit with India. And so, so they got something, but it didn't, it didn't describe the society that they were trying to understand. So that's a part of it. Um, and then the second part, of course, is that then these are built into products um, that are sometimes helpful, sometimes well-meaning, and sometimes uh, designed for control, most famously facial recognition. Um, and so there is this spectrum that companies hold um, that is being aggressively marketed to majority world societies. And then that raises the question of how do local regulators react to this? And again, in part, if we're thinking in terms of benign regulators, the problem might be that there uh, they may not have questioned the data and the imaginaries that went into the product. And so although it might look beneficial, uh, it, it may actually be a little more, more problematic than they've realized. Uh, but, but the other issue is also that there are technologies that have been flagged as harmful, like facial recognition, that are gradually getting banned in the, major, in the minority world, but are being embraced in the majority world because we're, these are fragile democracies, some are not democracies, and some don't have strong regulators. Um, and so I think that that is a troubling question because how does, um, how does a company based in the minority world that has been regulated appropriately in the minority world justify um, engaging in activities that would be illegal in its home country um, in, in the majority world? Um, and you know, I, I think that that is a troubling question that we need to think about. And the third, which I'm just going to drop in because you are the expert on this, Anupam, and I'm hoping to uh, provoke you to revoke your moderator's privilege and react to it, is that um, if the majority world countries um, decide that that they want to want to question this this sort of this data driven algorithmic society. Um, what are they going to do about trade agreements that are crafted in ways that mandate the free flow of data now that we know that the free flow of data has certain implications yeah, in the algorithmic society. I'm going to stop here because I'm very eager to hear what everyone else says, uh, but, but this is these, these are my high level questions. Thank you. Those are terrific provocations um, and insights. Um, and I, I was taking diligent notes uh, on all of the above. Um, Lucilla. Um, the European Commission, as you are well aware, has just uh, launched a very, sing I mean, has over the last few years uh, been working on uh, uh, a very significant uh, AI regulation, uh, an AI act that, um, you know, the proposal um, just landed in April with, uh, I think, 108 pages um, <laughs> to read, and I have uh, tried to make my way through most of it, but not uh, have, have not yet finished all of it. Um, so the European Union is taking a very aggressive, and I think really the kind of uh, the most significant uh, proposal, uh, the most ambitious AI regulation the world has yet seen. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the European Union's approach to AI? Well, thank you very much, first of all, for inv inviting me here, and I will I will share my uh, presentation to 
uh, try to illustrate in uh, maybe hopefully 10 minutes um, exactly what we have been proposing. Now, this is only, this is, I, I will be, uh, um, I'm sorry. I think I cannot change the slides for some reason. Maybe make sure to click on that um, slide. Yeah, no, show I know that window is active. Is yeah. happening. Okay, there. Okay, um, I hope uh, I hope it will be okay. Um, so the first thing I want to say is that for the European Union, artificial intelligence is a very important technology. So we are very much into supporting research in AI and also supporting the uptake, for example, by small medium enterprises, because we see all the benefits that can come from AI in all the sector of the economies and society. And it's really this versatility of AI, which makes it almost, some people say, a general purpose technology but anyway, a technology that is very, very useful in uh, um, uh, all different sectors. Um, however, artificial intelligence may create some risk and some of these risks have just been uh, reminded and they're mostly in terms of uh, violating in the European Union, the safety standards that we have, as well as the fundamental rights. And when I talk about fundamental rights, of course, I talk about the whole set of fundamental rights, but with artificial intelligence, I think it's very often the issue of non-discrimination, which uh, uh, becomes very important because of course, AI learns from the past, our past, uh, and therefore our biases can be exas exacerbated. So every time that uh, the bias or the is, is an important element, of uh, the use of artificial intelligence or the outcome of artificial intelligence, then in that case, there is a strong risk of violation of fundamental rights um, uh, for the minorities, but not only. Now, we do not, uh, so we have come forward with uh, the idea of a regulatory framework to, um, uh, to address these issues. And the reason why we want to address them is that because we noticed that some businesses in the European Union, I would actually say 65% of them do not use AI because they think that their customers uh, will, uh, will have issues with it. And so our framework is also aimed at enhancing the use of AI and not at um, slowing it down. Um, uh, and what we have done, as I said, it's not about it's not uh, regulating the technology, but it's very much trying to impose rules to certain artificial intelligence systems that are used in some context. So to be able to do that, we had to build a pyramid of risk, which is what you have on the slide. And basically we think that most of the artificial intelligence systems are not risky at all. And that's why the base is green and yellow. We have introduced some transparency obligation for some applications like chatbots that maybe are not obviously, you know, chatbots that people may, uh, may not recognize as such or deep fakes for public interest, for example, that are not easily understandable as deep fakes. We think that they should be labeled as such, uh, but most of our regulation is about high risk. So it's about identifying a specific list of high risk use cases that uh, will have to follow certain rules. And then on top of the pyramid, very small, we have a list of prohibited practices. And here we include remote biometric identification in real time. This is not just facial recognition. This is remote biometric identification used by law enforcement authorities in real time, meaning, um, for example, if uh, uh, the, 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 the police uh, is using the footage of video cameras to identify a watch list, and then on the basis of these results, um, um, intervening and, and stopping people uh, at that moment. So we find that very intrusive and we think, we think that that should be possible only in the presence of very serious crimes, or for example, of a terroristic attack. And so we introduce, exceptions for the use of this technology by the police, but this is only in the presence of very serious crimes. Now, as I said, most of the artificial intelligence systems will not be high risk, but some of them uh, are. And as I said, we have identified a specific list of these high risk use cases on the basis of 
um, a, an evaluation of risk uh, that we have used that can be found in our proposal and in the impact assessment that accompanies the proposal, as well as uh, um, evidence that we had from um, the use of these artificial intelligence systems. And basically, we have introduced rules for um, products that Im were embed artificial intelligence when these products uh, and these artificial intelligence uh, have safety issues for uh, the user, as well as some applications uh, which vary in different fields. Uh, these are the lists that you have in category two that go from employment to education to uh, some public services, uh, banking services, um, administration of justice. Now in the annex of our regulation, you find the more specific use cases this is just a summary of the, what we consider to be the sensitive areas. And we will be able to change that specific list over time through what we call in Europe a delegated act, which is basically an act that is discussed between the Commission and the member states. And it's much easier to change than a piece of regulation. But what are uh, what is the system that we propose? We propose to uh, use the CE marking system for, for this kind of artificial intelligence systems. This is a, a system which is already in place in the European Union for products that may have safety implications and simply require that before the product uh, is put on the market, then there are some checks of that product that need to be made. These are called conformity assessment, but these are basically bodies that make certain checks about that product or that services before it is introduced in the European Union. And what do they check for artificial intelligence? We would like to check the quality of the data sets that have been used to train uh, the artificial intelligence system, the documentation that we request that is put in place because we will need that also for traceability reasons. We want to check that the uh, provider is also informing the user of the characteristic of that artificial intelligence system is uh, informing the user of the kind of the human oversight that will have to be put in place, as well as um, have to provide information about robustness, accuracy, and cybersecurity of that system. So these are obligations that fall mostly on the provider of the artificial intelligence system. The user will have some obligations, but not many, because um, we, 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 you know, we're very much focusing here on the provider and we are also, whether the provider is European, American or Asian, everybody will have to follow the system. And before they place their product or service in the European Union, they will have to check that these obligations are complied with um, uh, in the European Union. And then one just, just one last word. Uh, we have also introduced uh, uh, the possibility of regulatory sandboxes for artificial intelligence. This is linked to our data protection regulation. Here we introduce the possibility for data that have been lawfully collected uh, to be used to train artificial intelligence systems for other reasons for which the data were collected, uh, but still with a very strong public interest and under the supervision of the data authority. So this is in 10 minutes, I think, my presentation of uh, our artificial intelligence framework. I hope it was sufficiently clear because I went very quickly. Uh, but as I said, it's about checking artificial intelligence systems that are high risk, that are clearly listed before they're placed on the market in the European Union. And then if this is going to minimize the risk that violation of fundamental rights or safety may arise, if harm happens, we will have a market surveillance authority system in place to trace back the source of the problem and that traceability is made possible by the documentation and the transparency requirements of our obligations. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Lucella. That was a wonderful overview of the 108 page proposal. Um, and you, I think, were even faster than your ten, allotted 10 minutes. Uh, so thank you. Um, Jessica, uh, you served as the director of the uh, Consumer Protection uh, Bureau at the FTC. Um, you have been at the forefront of dealing with uh, applications of AI. 
Um, and so can you tell us a little bit about how the U.S. is a, approaching these issues and also where you think there might be gaps in the regulation? Well, like others, I am very delighted to be here um, on, on this Friday morning. Uh, and I wanna echo um, what others have already said without repeating it too much that um, AI can bring good and bad um, outcomes, just like any data use. And we've been dealing with that for years. Um, and, you know, cause it raises privacy, accuracy, fairness, and transparency issues that have to be sorted out. Um, so um, to answer your question though, in the United States, AI as a process on its own is generally unregulated in the United States. There are many non-binding principles and standards for AI and there are increasing number of legislative proposals, but there's very few AI specific regulations at this point. The standards and principles, and we've seen this from the White House, from the FTC and other um, sources, generally require transparency, truthfulness, non-discrimination, accountability, but are pretty vague at this point. Um, a few states, um, Illinois and Virginia in particular, have um, laws governing facial recognition, which is a particularly concerning um, use of AI, but it's still very limited at this point uh, in the states, even though there's lots of proposals. However, and this is my main point, um, it's really, really important to understand that AI is a business process. It's a technology um, that's incorporated into a wide array of companies and products and services that are regulated. Um, it's not a separate isolated thing, and it's also not new. AI has existed in the financial area uh, for years and, you know, Credit scores is our AI, you know. Um, it's just expanded vastly and there's new applications of AI. So it, it definitely requires a lot of attention. But um, so because all these companies, products and services already fall under many, many laws, this means that all the federal and laws, uh, federal and state laws that apply to them apply to their AI, the FTC Act. Um, bans unfair deceptive practices. And it, the FTC has applied it to AI in various contexts. The Fair Credit Reporting Act requires transparency, accuracy, and privacy in credit reporting, which uses AI extensively. The Civil Rights Acts ban discrimination, regardless of whether a human does it or a machine does it. Um, IP laws, um, um, intellectual property laws, insurance laws, they govern any business process in those areas that use AI. So you can't escape responsibility for a business decision just because you delegated it to an algorithm. Um, but there are significant gaps as you were um, alluding to. First, the existing laws have gaps even before you factor AI into the equation. And for example, the FTC Act, which I talked about is probably the broadest law here, but it doesn't, it has gaps, jurisdictional gaps, and it doesn't contain specific mandates. It's not like a regulation. It's you, the FTC can question what a company is doing one company at a time. Um, there's no nationwide privacy law still. There's fragmented laws across different sectors in different states, and that's the subject of a whole other debate, but it's very relevant to AI. The anti-discrimination laws apply to particular clearly apply to advertising, for example, even though there's been debate about that. Anna Pam, did you? We lost you for a split second. Could you repeat oh, okay. that? You said the anti-discrimination laws, and I they, then we hit yeah. Okay. They um they apply to particular situations and they have various definitions in them and they scope, they don't ac uh, apply across the board, you know, no discrimination um, anywhere, you know, um, and they're fragmented and um, they don't apply to advertising clearly, for example, even though 
um, they have been applied to advertising. They don't, by their terms, do that. Um, so that's one set of issues, the gaps in existing laws. A second set of issues is that AI, of course, raises some unique issues that are new, that require special attention, like misidentification of people of color using facial recognition, misidentification as criminals, that's been happening. Um, use of bots for customer service, um, which is which Lucilla called out as, 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 a, as a concern. Um, liability safety and safety issues for autonomous vehicles. Um, so that's just a few examples. Um, and then third, um, when, you're, when companies are using AI, they don't naturally apply the same oversight as when using human processes, because they're delegating it to a machine. Um, and this is particularly true when they buy AI products or services from third parties, then they're just completely relying. They, don't even, they didn't even build the AI themselves. They don't even know what factors went into it. Um, so to ensure accountability, we need to add those processes back in. And this is something Lucila talked about with the EU regulation by requiring things like risk assessment, testing the algorithms and the outcomes they produce, possibly human oversight to ensure, for example, there's no um, uh, discrimination and other adverse outcomes. Um, and the accountability for AI obtained from third parties is is an important piece of this. Should, should a company that acquires AI from somebody else be fully liable for problems with the AI? That's an important question to answer. So these um, processes aren't generally required by current laws, although um, it, without getting into too much detail, there is one law that provides an interesting model here, which is the Fair Credit Reporting Act, which does to some extent um, require this kind of process as part of it. And the reason these processes are important is it not only increases a company's own accountability, but it um, enhances oversight um, by regulatory enforcement bodies that can, you know, look at the examination that the company undertook, look at that, those processes, and as Lucila said, trace back where the problem arose. Um, so, um, you know, obviously, I think we're going to get to what are the solutions and just big picture. Um, we need to update regulations to add these types of processes. Um, some agencies may be able to do this through guidance because their regulations already technically apply to AI. And I know the banking agencies in this country are already working towards that. And in cases where AI raises unique issues that can't be addressed by existing laws and that aren't addressed by existing laws, either Congress needs to act or the agencies, if they have authority, the US agencies need to um, prescribe regulations or issue guidance in those areas. So thank you. I hope I didn't take more than my allotted 10 minutes, but I'm eager for the conversation. So we're at the 1029 mark, um, and um, that means that we've had the introductions and all three 10 minutes uh, talks uh, with it within um, uh, 29 minutes. So thank you all. Uh, uh, Jessica raised uh, a lot of uh, really important questions about how to regulate AI. So that uh, and I kept on thinking, Chinmayi, about what you began with, about some of the concerns about as the AI is developed, say, in the Western market, and then migrated to the, the rest of the world, um, the kind of uh, institutional competence questions about, you know, is, are the regulators ready to understand, to query, to push back? Uh, against the claims of the uh, providers of the AI services. How do you feel about the way that the uh, countries across the, the global majority countries are, are, are prepared or, or not? Um, and do you have any suggestions on that front? I thank you. That's a that's a great question. I would imagine that there's a variation, um, and so I think that we can expect South Korea, for example, to be a lot more sophisticated um, than India, just because of the uh, the the degree to which South Korea has already been using uh, 
data and algorithms. Um, I, I think that if, if one were based, and so let, let me use India here because I've seen the contrast of being, you know, between being based in India and being based in the US at academic institutions. I think a profound difference is just the uh, data to which you get access. Um, and so the, the papers and the academic spaces that you can access if you're based in the US or Europe are dramatically different from what you can access if you're based in India. And you need that understanding and the access to the most contemporary debates to understand to make suggestions to regulators uh, about how they can regulate in sophisticated ways. Um, and so I think that that's a fundamental problem of, of how do we make sure that the knowledge systems and the social movements are keeping pace with, uh, with the products that are being developed in the West. And so, you know, at the same time um, at which Boston was debating banning facial recognition, I was walking through Hyderabad airport that had all these posters saying facial recognition is here, try it out, right? Um, and I see, so I think that that gap is a part of the problem. The second is that I think that the sophistication with which the EU is able to regulate the kind of regulators, uh, the, the place um, at which regulators are in, in, you know, kind of dealing with light touch, uh, not so light touch, the pyramid based regulation, not all regulators in all countries are quite there yet. And if the only people they have to look to to gain expertise about how these systems work are the companies themselves, um, then, I, they, then they have a problem in, in crafting systems that would actually uh, help the people. That uh, seems uh, uh, really important that if they are uh, re relying entirely upon the companies, then they're uh, really likely to be on the back foot. Um, and it's actually quite alarming to me that you say India is not prepared because if you are looking across uh, the quote, global south, um, you would expect that India might be the most, one of the most advanced in these areas. And so if India is not prepared, it's hard to imagine, you know, Bangladesh or Pakistan being um, really uh, ready at all. Uh, so let me return to you, Lachilla. One of the questions that I, uh, you know, am interested in is this uh, decision by the EU to approach this from an omnibus perspective. Um, this was, of course, the decision made in, in, uh, with the 1995 Data Protection Directive, an omnibus approach. Um, and the United States is slowly moving towards that um, after some quarter century. Jessica's, <laughs> we, uh, yeah, so, you know, uh, I, what, what is hopeful, uh, uh, I mean, it, I don't think it'll ever be as omnibus as the European approach, because I, I think it won't apply to government data because they're that will be regulated separately, I think, by the existing statutes. Um, but in any case, uh, the, uh, the omnibus approach that the European Union has taken, as, as opposed to the kind of more precision, um, here's the problem, and Jessica described, well, let's see if we can, if there, there might be opportunities for guidance, there might be opportunities for regulation, and there might be opportunities for laws. Um, so uh, agency regulation, agency guidance, uh, or congressional laws as interventions, depending upon the particular cases. Um, and of course, second, secondarily with that, Lucilla, you have proposed the creation of an AI board, a Europe-wide AI board. Uh, which is also an interesting um, uh, decision um, to create a, you know, a pan-European uh, uh, advisory or supervisory board that's akin, I guess, to the uh, data protection supervisory board. Uh, so I'd love to hear about your, dis your thought processes within the commission um, as you chose this route. Yeah, thank you for, for this question. It's really uh, bring me back to all the challenges we had in the design from the very beginning. So, as I said earlier, AI applies to so many fields. And when I showed you the list of use cases that we would like to regulate, they go from employment to education, to critical infrastructure, to, to uh, medical devices. So things that are very different from each other. And, um, but we have decided to introduce the same rules because the problem at the end of the day is always the same. The problem is the fact that AI is opaque 
uh, autonomous, complex, and you need to increase transparency of this AI and you need to uh, allow for traceability of what's going on. So uh, what you can ask for in all this setting is simply to please make sure you use the best quality data sets actually representative of the, the, the place and the, where you are going to apply your AI. Please uh, uh, make sure that all the documentation is there so we know which parameters have been fed in the AI. Um, and so on, so that you can trace back in case there is a problem where the problem is. But these kind of obligations um, are the same for us across all the different cases, because for us, the problem of artificial intelligence remains the same, regardless of the different sector to which it is applied. Um, now, you could have thought of, uh, for example, or we could have thought of applying this to biometric identification only, uh, and then maybe later to the self-driving cars and so on. But this would have also required a much bigger legislative work that I'm not sure that is actually needed. What we will need is that standards get developed to, um, uh, to, to respond to these obligations. And then these standards are likely to decline these obligations maybe in slightly different ways across the different applications. Um, and uh, about the artificial intelligence board, well, this is a need we have in the European Union uh, to ensure consistency among member states. Now, I don't know if you have the same problem in the United States because you are much more integrated than uh, we are in the European Union, but the implementation of our regulation takes place in the member states. So these, uh, Conformity assessment process before the good is placed in the market takes place in a notified body in a member state. And then the market surveillance authority is in the member state of the user. Um, therefore, we have the need at the European Union level to make sure that there is consistency in the implementation. And that's why we need to create a board where we bring all the representatives of the member states, for example, the market surveillance authorities together, together with the data protection supervisor um, um, and, and work together. I also, another big difference I think should be kept in mind when comparing also with the United States is the fact that we also have a general data protection regulation. This regulation already alleviates some issues in terms of privacy that artificial intelligence may create when it processes personal data. This is something that our regulation on AI takes as a given. And so I just want to highlight this after hearing the comments from the United States, because I speak about privacy a lot less than you do, because we already have the data protection regulation in place. And I just wanted to clarify this point. Jessica, um, I ask, invite you to comment on Lucilla's uh, thought process at the commission. And obviously um, the European Union is a different uh, confederation than the United States states are. Um, so that does create, uh, you know, one what might make very different choices um, as to how one uh, implements one's uh, uh, regulatory norms. Well, she's, oh. Yeah, she's absolutely right that the that that not having a privacy a, na a nationwide privacy legislation federal legislation in the United States is a huge gap and um, leads uh, uh, AI concerns even less addressed in the United States than in the European Union. Um, in terms of whether to do this in a centralized way in the US or not, I think you could go either way. My point was more, we have all these laws on the books. They're not, there's gaps, but we have them on the books. They already apply to AI. And, and at the very least, we should make sure some of these accountability processes for AI are incorporated into them. That could be done through some sort of omnibus law by Congress or Congress or the administration should, could direct all the agencies that have oversight over these laws to either amend their regulations or they may find they can do this, they can update through guidance because you know the, 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 the 
legal basis is already there. That's the floor. Then we need to fill the gaps and we need to um, address AI specific issues like facial recognition. But, um, and the gaps include privacy, but I think you could go either way um, as to whether it's an omnibus law updating what we have and filling the gaps or whether agencies are directed to bring their regulations up to date and then Congress acts in the areas where there are still gaps, if that, if that makes any sense. You, you could go either way. Great, that, that um, does make sense. I see in the comments uh, some questions that are converging on uh, 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 a point about the Brussels effect um, going to Lucilla. Um, here, uh, and Tom, Thomas Strines asked this question. Uh, so first, let me ask, the, the, he asked two questions, but I'll ask the first one uh, that he poses. Um, uh, as Lucilla points out, he writes, the regulation applies to everyone who places AI systems on the European market following the GDPR's example. Um, so however, placing on the market doesn't necessarily mean shipping a physical good to Europe. Um, it can simply meaning, mean having a website. Clearview AI, for example, which is very much in the uh, target uh, targets of the European uh, Union Data Th uh, Protection Authorities at the moment. Uh, and so uh, how is the EU going to enforce this AI regulation against any website that makes AI systems available in Europe? Um, and I'll ask the second part of this, th what uh, Thomas and others are, are asking, does this essentially have the, the sim similar effect as the Brussels effect, which is kind of de facto, the, the AI regulations proposed in Europe become the global norm as companies that are operating globally uh, comport with them as the simplest way to, to manage their operations, their global operations. So I, I use the, the wording of placing on the market as a good because that's probably the, the easiest one uh, uh, in our mind. But of course, uh, uh, it can be a kind of a service uh, um, that is uh, supplied through a website in the European Union. Um, and then uh, also in this case, it needs to be checked before it is, uh, 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 in this case, we say that it is actually uh, put in use in the European Union. So uh, is it difficult to monitor? Uh, maybe it is, but uh, we have, as I was saying earlier, put in place uh, uh, market surveillance authorities from this point of view, so that uh, um, uh, if uh, there is uh, any wrongdoing, normally consumers would be able also to, to flag this if the authorities didn't, uh, didn't find them. Of course, uh, if you have um, you know, companies that start having you know, big market shares, that is going to be much more visible than, than for others. Um, for clear views, well, I did mention the fact that we tend to, we forbid, actually prohibit uh, remote biometric identification in public places by, by law enforcement authorities in, when it's done in real time. Uh, the private use is actually forbidden already by the General Data Protection Regulation. So we don't need to do that in our artificial intelligence system. What we need in our AI regulation, what we need to do is to extend it also to the use by law enforcement authorities. Um, yeah, I don't know if I've answered the question. No, that's super helpful. Um, I wanted to turn to a question posed to Chinmayi. By the way, uh, I so uh, we chose to have this early morning time um, in uh, in the East Coast of the United States so that we could make this uh, our conversation uh, available to people as they're still awake uh, across much of the world. And so I'm delighted to have participants from across the world, um, uh, even though what I think is quite late already in Australia. And uh, uh, so, so I, for, for those who are tuning in from New Zealand and Australia, I, I uh, sympathize. Um, so one person, Sondre Austin Landvik asks to Chinmayi. Uh, Chinmayi pointed out through an anecdote that the British colonial powers in India gather, gather data that were not representative of cultural notions in Indian society. 
when AI is traded as a commodity across the EU, may there not be different consequences due to the free flow of services pertaining to the use and consumption of AI technology? Um, and so essentially, I think this is a question uh, that begins from Chinmayi's observation, but turns to uh, uh, back to Luchilla, uh, this, uh, this issue of uh, the fact that within the 27 member states, you do have different cultures um, and uh, the same AI technology trying to make a determination about someone may not understand uh, the behavior, say in recruitment, as you as you uh, reference, um, that the recruitment behaviors of a person from Norway may appear different than even a person from Sweden or let alone a person from Poland or France. It's a question for me. Yes. 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 So one of the, the, the requirements that we have introduced uh, is about uh, the quality of the data sets, and that would include uh, the representativeness of the training data uh, to the uh, place, let's say, where the artificial intelligence system is going to be used. So if I want to use basically normally what happens in the European Union in any case is that many services and products are actually addressed to the whole of the European Union. And, uh, um, uh, but if uh, uh, there were services or products addressed simply to one nation, for example, then it would have to be trained uh, also with the data of that particular nation to, to which it will be applied. So we consider this a very important point because we've also, experienced it. Uh, there are many examples of, as you, as you gave as well, where uh, the artificial intelligence system is trained with data that are completely different uh, and, uh, and therefore then uh, uh, the use is actually, um, can be very complicated. But uh, yes, this is exactly what we request. Great. Uh, Maruisa Levesque poses a question for Chinmayi. Uh, so, do you see any traction for the UN guiding principles on business and human rights to curb problematic deployment in the global majority from minority-based co uh, companies? C can John Ruggie help? I wish I could say yes, but I'm sorry, I'm not optimistic. I mean, it's um, it's always helpful to have a standard. Um, so, so that we we have something to aspire to. But the thing with the Ruggi principles is that they're not enforceable. Um, and it's not really in the company's interests all of the time to follow them. And oftentimes it's also not in the interests of the people governing states uh, to follow them. And I'm, I'm making that distinction because I, I think that the people that make decisions are don't always reflect uh, the, the needs of, of others. But since, since we've come to me, would you mind if I hopped back to Sandra's question? <laughs> I think it's such a great question. One is that I want to flag for all of you who are interested in the whole British Empire and information collection. The anecdote is from um, Chris Bailey's book. He's a historian of, of the empire. It's on, on uh, information and the empire in India and uh, the British bureaucratic efforts to get a handle on Indian society enough to, to govern it appropriately. Uh, but if you know, I think that that's a great question because I'm not saying ban all AI, and this is an opportunity for, for me to put that forward, but understand all AI is a spectrum. Um, and so the, the things that are obviously intrusive and, um, and, and are rapidly enmeshing themselves with society is the ways in which AI is being used for the delivery of public services. And so, so you know, in India, the most controversial uh, system to, be, to begin that process is Aadhaar, which was trying to get all Indians on the grid and then use that data uh, in, in deciding how different public services will be delivered. Uh, but there's other kinds of technology stepping away from AI. I just want to give you an example of how something that looks innocent can go very wrong if you don't understand the context in which it's, it's introduced. Um, and so uh, the technology that's used to look at look at babies and uh, incidentally determines their gender while they're in the womb, that when it hit India was um, it was at the receiving end of a social movement, essentially, because it changed the potential of what used to be female infanticide to female feticide, where pregnant women would be scanned. And then if the baby was not a boy, uh, the baby would be aborted. So that technology actually got banned in India because people were concerned about it. 
Uh, and yeah, so I, I think that the that the fundamental thing is one is that uh, in the delivery of public services and the acquisition of public data sets, that's where uh, the global majority needs to exercise the most caution because that's difficult to walk back. But for other uses of AI, there needs to be an intentional evaluation of uh, whether it is innocuous. Is it is it like a new wine? Is it a you know cool way to do a new thing, or is it likely to to be harmful? Great. That's really fascinating because in the United States, as you know, it's generally common uh, for people to identify the gender of their uh, their baby to be. Uh, and, uh, and as you point out, that has that uh, innocuous uh, use of technology in the United States could have very uh, uh, harmful effects elsewhere. Uh, and so the simple application of technology across borders uh, could lead to really uh, horrific outcomes. Um, and in fact, early on, um, you know, I'll, I'll editorialize here, Google found itself at, in, in some hot water because it was allowing advertising for these products um, in India. Um, and uh, so, uh, and it, uh, you know, uh, was, uh, uh, I don't know if it was fined, but it was appropriately, uh, it was disciplined um, by the Indian authorities for supporting this illegal activity in India. Um, okay. so. Uh, there's an interesting conversation in the in the chat about uh, whether or not uh, uh, the data protections uh, omnibus approach is actually an appropriate one. But let me let me uh, ask uh, Jessica to kind of jump in on any of the questions that we've had thus far. Oh, sorry. Um, well, based on some of the discussion. Um, a, a few things cropped up in my mind that I wanted to emphasize. Um, one is that, and this kind of goes to the whole values, and what, one is that um, in the United States, at least, well, that many proposals I see on regulation in the AI space and, you know, even in other areas of data protection, they ask for a risk assessment and they're not, but they're not really tied to some underlying standard. You can't just ask a company to, I mean, I've literally seen statutes where they have a whole AI provision that says you have to assess risk and do all this stuff, but then it doesn't say there any, doesn't give any bottom line standard that you're trying to achieve. And that's gonna be completely unenforceable and meaningless. And um, which is one of the reasons I emphasize the, the presence of existing laws that apply to AI and why we would wanna tie any additional regulation where possible to those existing standards, because then you have, um, you have underlying standards and regulate in the regulation that, that your risk assessment has to um, address. So, so that's very important. Um, and then in terms of the chat about um, about centralization, um, we, you know, the U.S. has taken an approach of, of a more decentralized approach to privacy, and at least in the privacy area, it hasn't worked well. Um, companies even are now very distressed because um, in the absence of federal leadership, having an overarching privacy or data protection standard for the United States, now Indirectly, the EU is, is calling all the shots, at least for multinational companies. And now the U United States, 50 states, all want to enact their own privacy laws. And so um, even companies now who until recently loved the de a decentralized approach and a case-by-case -case approach are supporting um, federal legislation because they're, they're scared of all these conf potentially conflicting standards. So thank you. Uh, the, that does uh, the the kind of history of data protection law um, in our data privacy law um, in the Europe and the United States does lead to um, you know a question as to what it, what lessons do we learn from that history? And I think that's a that's a key question. We're going to have a conversation in another month or so with Max Schrems. Uh, connecting uh, issues of data protection to AI. So I encourage those in the audience to come back for 
uh, for that conversation. Um, a number of people in the in the chat are asking questions about climate change and the impact of AI on climate change. This is an issue raised by Timnit Gebru in a paper uh, on uh, natural language models. Um, and uh, so I'm curious uh, if you guys have any um, suggestions or thoughts on, on that issue. Luch uh, uh, Luchella? Yeah. Um, yes, I mean, it's a very important uh, topic uh, because on the one hand, uh, artificial intelligence has a lot of applications that can help us in the fight against climate change. Just think about optimizing resources in energy, in agriculture, and actually, I think in the States as well as in the European Union, uh, it's funny to see how the agro-food sector, which was maybe the last one to digitize, is one of the most advanced when it comes to the use of artificial intelligence. Um, on the other hand, however, especially the use of deep learning means using a lot of energy. And I think when they, um, for example, refer to the, to the uh, natural language processing models, of course, uh, the GPT-3, for example, is known for being very energy consuming. Uh, we are in the European Union, we support uh, a research program for the European Union. And uh, uh, we do have a line uh, of, of support for research for um, ways of, uh, you know, carrying out or using artificial intelligence or training models of artificial intelligence in uh, um, more energy efficient ways. And then we also have a full program the United States does as well on the semiconductor side, because of course, those are the real uh, components that power our computing systems, and therefore they have to become much more efficient as well. The GPUs and all those components that have helped the rise of artificial intelligence, they have to become more energy efficient as well. So I'm gonna ask a question uh, posed by Dan Kinney, um, one of our uh, uh, students, um, uh, about um, disclosure, whether there should be a requirement to disclose where the data that you use for training the models came from. Um, so this is an issue that's been posed in, um, in, uh, in patents, for example, when you have a drug discovery, uh, should you be required to disclose where the, any biological materials that you, or genetic materials that you uh, used for that, uh, that molecule uh, came from. Uh, and uh, so, Dan asks, should uh, AI companies have to disclose the origin of their data? Um, yeah. um, in the consumer, in, in, in my experience at the FTC for a quarter of a century, um, we use disclosure all the time to create accountability. And what we learned, especially in the privacy area, is that consumers are overwhelmed with disclosures. And while it, it can be um, a remedy that can create accountability, certainly data breach, it's helped create accountability. Um, you have to think carefully about whether consumers are gonna use all these additional disclosures. If there's a value that that people want to um, want to enforce, the better approach would probably be to enact a law saying, for example, you have to make sure you know any data you obtained was obtained legally, or you know something that is self-executing -ex and doesn't require um, consumers or other observers to have to weed through lots of disclosures to figure out, you know, whether they're dealing with a good company. Um, I think we're at the uh, near the close, and I just wanted to give each of you a chance to offer some final remarks. Uh, let's begin with uh, Lucilla. I would like to say that uh, um, um, that it is very interesting to discuss with uh, colleagues in the United States because um, there is so much interest in the United States. Now, our proposal is just a proposal from the European Commission, meaning that we still have to discuss it 
with the European Parliament and with the European Council. So the final proposal will really exist in a couple of years time, which is a bit of a long time, but that's how our democratic process is organized. Uh, so I, I, I really enjoy the conversations with the United States because many of the uh, ideas we have uh, are not new. They have also been uh, thought and discussed uh, in, in the United States at the federal level or at the state level. And I think uh, we have a lot of common challenges and a lot of common interests. And I, I really look forward to, to work with the US government, but also with universities and great organizations like NIST. I think I saw it mentioned in the chat, which is very advanced for the standards in particular for, for facial recognition, biometric identification. And, uh, and I, I, I really look forward to this dialogue in the future. So thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you, Lucilla. Um, Chinmayi. I, um, I think it's going to be a challenge to deal with the impact of Western dangerous technology uh, in, in the majority world. Um, and I think that what I would leave you with is, uh, is two ways to think about it. The third, of course, is that the states in the majority world could act, but we know that not all of them are going to. And so the question is, is what kind of international agreement is possible uh, that would restrain some of the ill effects of this technology on the world. Um, and the second is that what can states um, who house the companies that are exporting this technology do about it? Yeah, I, if, we, if we don't address that, there's just going to be these sort of these invisible pockets in basically most of the world in which quite a lot of harm is happening. Yeah, yeah. Um, Jessica earlier had talked about understanding AI. Um, and I, again, in that context, was thinking about the regulators across the world that are would really uh, be, uh, you know, have uh, limited resources and, uh, you know, whether they would have the capacity. And so uh, we, this is an, uh, an area where we're going to need some international uh, collaboration, certainly. Um, Jessica. I was about to say uh, some similar stuff. So what I would just like to punctuate at the end, which agrees with all my colleagues, I think, is that in the US, regardless of whether AI is tackled sort of issue by issue or in a central way, it needs to be tackled across the board, broadly across our economy and our national security infrastructure, which means that leadership needs to be shown either by our administration or Congress to make sure that happens. And another reason it needs to be, um, there needs to be leadership at a centralized way is that we do need to engage with our counterparts abroad because this is a really overarching international issue and we want to um, harmonize approaches as much as we can. Thank you all and, and thanks to Nick. Um... To, and to Kyoko Yoshinaga for really spearheading this whole AI governance uh, project, to April Doss, uh, to Ian Whitney um, uh, behind the scenes. I really appreciate it. I learned uh, a tremendous amount from all of you. I think we all have a kind of shared vision, even if uh, we're kind of representing different jurisdictions for purposes of this conversation. Um, and I think uh, you know there is a way forward. Thank you so much, all of you. Just one final note um, and thanking everybody for attendees. Please note this is an ongoing series of talks on AI governance. Our next event will be June 16th when we will have a panel discussing AI and civil society. So on behalf of the Georgetown Institute of Technology Law and Policy and the Yale Information Society Project, thank you to everybody who's attended and for our wonderful panelists and moderator. Thank you for these tremendous insights. <laughs>